Good morning, everyone. It's a astounding scene. I think a wonderful depiction of what that miracle might have actually been like. The wedding in Cana. I wonder if there was anything about that from the chosen that surprised you. When we read the biblical account here in John chapter 2, or when we read any account from the Bible, we in our minds play the role of the director and the actors. We kind of envision in our minds what we think that particular story will be like. Sometimes when we see someone else's version, kind of like we just saw in The Chosen, we might think to ourselves, huh, I never thought about it like that before. Interesting that they made that particular choice. Well, today, as we study John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, this particular miracle, I want you to intentionally take on that role of the movie director. You're the one who's making the choices about how this scene plays out. But first, I think it's important that we review. It's been a couple weeks since we've been in our study. And so far in our sermon series through the Gospel of John, we've worked our way all the way through chapter one. We learned about someone called the Word. We learned that the Word is God who became human. The Word is one way that John, who we believe is the writer of this particular account, describes Jesus. And then the story began, and we met another guy named John, this time John the Baptist. And he introduced us to someone called the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Well, that Lamb of God also turned out to be Jesus. And finally, the story described Jesus' interaction with five of the 12 men who would become his disciples. All of them, Jesus and the five men, were from Israel's northern province called Galilee. They had all traveled down south to where John the Baptist was baptizing hundreds and thousands of people at the Jordan River. So between John chapters 1 and John chapters 2, we need to fill in some details. After John baptized Jesus, we learn that Jesus decided to head back north. When they arrived, if we go over to the account in Matthew, we read that Jesus went by himself into the wilderness for 40 days, during which time he fasted and was tempted by the devil. The fishermen, these other five guys, that was their job. They had mouths to feed, and so they got their boats and their nets, and they went back out onto the Sea of Galilee because they had families. They had to care for them. That was the way they made money. But eventually, Jesus returned, and he called them out, this time to formerly follow him. Now, up until this time, for his whole life, Jesus was a handyman. Sometimes people call him the carpenter, but in those days, the carpenter was much more diverse. They could be a mason. They could do a lot of different projects with their hands. But now, he's acting like a rabbi, a teacher. Also, up until this time, those five men were fishermen. Now, they're acting like the rabbi's followers. It's really kind of an unusual scene when you think about it. Imagine how this group of men would be viewed in our particular culture. Think about it this way. Imagine a person who works with their hands. Someone in our culture who maybe has a family business, a small business, a handyman business. Maybe they're a carpenter. Maybe they're a mason. They're good at fixing and building things. They never had any biblical or theological training, never went to a ministry school. They're the kind of people who wear Dickies and Carhartt. They've got their multi-tool right inside their front pocket. They're the kind of people that wear a baseball cap and have a pickup with tools in the back and a hitch that they carry their trailer along behind them. 
you know the person. They just have a knack for plumbing and electrical and carpentry and masonry. Maybe welding, maybe mechanics. They're fixing and building things their entire lives. That's who Jesus was. And then one day, this handyman person invites other people to start following them. Now, that's not really so odd in that particular world, in that particular culture, when you work with your hands. You might not even need to go to a trade school if you become an apprentice. You can learn on the job. In fact, that's how many fathers and mothers pass down knowledge to their children in this day and age. Still, last week, I was watching in my backyard and I heard this noise. It sounded like a, a person basically he's making the noise with their mouth. And then I looked over and two doors down, that little Amish neighbor boy had a stick. And he was going back and forth. You know what he was doing? He was pretending to be his dad who uses their weed eater to mow their grass. I mean, that's how it happens. That's an apprentice, someone who does what their master does. They just copy them. They imitate and they learn. And little by little, the master gives the apprentice some jobs to do. They teach them how to do the jobs. And little by little, the apprentice starts to learn the business and the trade. And little by little, the apprentice can actually do it all. And then the day comes when the apprentice becomes the master. And they can take over. Well, these apprentices are following Jesus. In their day and age, they're fishermen. Now, again, imagine who that might be in our day and age. I recently read the book, The Perfect Storm, thanks to John, who, who gave that to me. It's about professional fishermen. It's hard work. Dangerous work. They can spend sometimes long months on the sea, braving the incredible power of the ocean to try and make it work. And it's brutal. But I don't think ancient fishermen, as we think of most fishermen or hunters in our day, are kind of the same. In fact, when I think about Fishing and hunting in our day and age, it tends to be much more of a hobby or something that we do on the side because we enjoy it. it costs a lot of money, actually. For those of you that know hunting and fishing, you've probably invested a bit. What we need to think of when we think of those fishermen in Jesus' day, however, is smelly, dirty, hard labor. Jobs that break the body. Day in, day out, you're usually not getting rich from them. This is not a hobby or something that you do for fun. You're just trying to make ends meet. In fact, you're doing stuff that most people would never want to do. And so what do we think about? We think of people who work without health insurance, long hours. They're not having good benefits. They're the garbage collectors. Maybe the roofers, maybe the flagger force guys. Stop, slow, stop, slow with their walkie talkies in the hot sun, in the cold winter, in the rain. They're the burger flippers, the produce pickers that probably come from another country because nobody here wants to do that hard work. They're the warehouse workers. These are the guys that become apprentices of the handyman with the tools in his pickup. But here's the thing, their apprenticeship is very different. It's not different in the sense that it, there's a master who is calling people to be apprenticed to him. What makes their apprenticeship so different is that the handyman doesn't call the apprentices to become handyman like him. Instead, the handyman is now a teacher and he invites these apprentices to follow him and to learn how to reach people for God. I mean, think about how bizarre that is. 
a man who never went to Bible college, never went to seminary, is inviting other men who also have no religious training to reach people for God. Now, as one, me, who has had a lot of Bible college and seminary training, ministry training, I find this whole situation to be super bizarre. That's our story about a bizarre situation and a most unusual man. It's at this point that we pick up the story of Jesus and these five men in John chapter 2. So turn there, if you would, uh, page 861 in your pew Bibles, and I want to read the first two verses. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now, the place, first of all, is Cana. It's a small town next, just down the road from Jesus' own hometown of Nazareth. Kind of be like Smoketown and Burdenhand. Two very small towns right next to each other. The people pretty much know each other, especially if you've grown up there, you probably end up knowing each other. And so if you're from Nazareth, it's highly likely that you're going to get invited to a wedding of a family down the road in Cana. And also, weddings were super festive occasions, just like we saw from The Chosen on the video. Sometimes they could last a whole week. The celebration would just go on and on. And that brings us to verse 3, where we have this situation at the wedding, the wine has run out, and Mary says to Jesus, they have no more wine. And he says to her, dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. In their culture, this is a major problem. Clean drinking water was probably only found at the local well. Not easy to get to, not something that you necessarily had a constant ready supply of, no indoor plumbing. And so wine was commonly used even in regular meals in the home. It was especially important then at a wedding, a celebration where it could last for, for days. And it ran out. This is a honor and shame culture that we're talking about here. Running out of wine would have been one of these very shameful faux pas that would have stuck in the memory of people. It would have been super embarrassing for the family. It would be for, for us at a wedding that we have as well, but people get over it. There, it was something that would have been just deeply, deeply embarrassing. And so Jesus' mom, Mary, just goes to him she makes what seems to be a totally innocent observation. Right? We don't know if everybody at the wedding knew about this. Mary just simply says, they have no more wine. But I don't think hers was an innocent remark. Now, it's interesting how Jesus responds. He could have said to his mom, oh, wow, that's a bummer, and just moved on. He could have looked at her with kind of a snide look like, mom, everyone already knows that. Or I already know that. Why are you telling me this? He could have ignored her. He could have answered her in many different ways. He could have pointed out to her that this situation had nothing to do with him. But he knew his mom. He knew exactly what she was getting at when she says to him, they have no more wine. Maybe it was her tone of voice. Maybe it was the twinkle in her eye. Mary was communicating something that she knew Jesus could handle this. And how does he respond? Dear woman, why do you involve me? He totally knows what Mary's doing here. He knows that 
She wants him to do something about this and that he has the ability to do something about this. He can solve the problem that this family is facing in this honor and shame culture. I love what we learn here about Jesus' relationship with his mom. It's so playful almost, so human. In this, we clearly see the humanity of Jesus. What Jesus says next is fascinating, though. My time has not yet come. Now, his ministry has already gotten started, but just barely. Even as the days will go by and his ministry continues on, in some of the other gospel accounts, you hear Jesus saying stuff like this. My time has not yet come. He'll do a miracle and then he'll tell people, hey, don't tell anybody about this. Keep it quiet. He's managing the pace of his ministry. He doesn't want to get too popular too fast. He knows that things are gradually working toward a very important conclusion. And so at this wedding in Cana, when Jesus says to her, my time has not yet come, he wants to keep that pace. He doesn't want to get ahead of himself. It's not too fast. It's not too slow. It's wanting to reach the finish line at the right time. Jesus is patient. He's concerned that if he does this miracle, changing water into wine, it could result in him becoming too popular too fast. Now, interestingly, the version of the chosen brings something out that also might have been going through his mind. We don't totally know. And that is, is he going to do this at all? Because at least the way the chosen depicts it, the moment he dips his hand in the water, it's him saying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Very similarly, as he would, have, as he would say years later in the garden before he was about to be crucified. Now, that's some speculation. The text doesn't say that, but it is a legitimate way of thinking what could be going on in this guy's mind at this point. Because he knows that no matter how much he says, my time has not yet come, or please don't tell anybody about this miracle, word's going to get out. Something is being set in motion now that cannot be stopped, and it will involve incredible pain for him in the end. And yet he does it. And that leads... To what happens next? Look in verse 5, John chapter 2. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. It's almost like Mary doesn't even acknowledge what Jesus has just said here. He's, he's saying, Hold on, woman, my time has not yet come. She maybe hears it, turns away, ignores it, and says, Servants, do what he says. It's really a, an interesting. Um, communication by Mary is almost like she dismisses Jesus. He's the Messiah. And Mary ignores what he's saying. Now, is she being rude? I don't think so. She's his mom. She can handle Jesus. It really shows us something amazing about Mary. I kind of wonder if she was a little bit of a fireball. She has been invited by God. She can remember this in her mind 30 years before. Invited by God to carry the Messiah. She says yes. At the time, she was just probably a teenager. Think about that. She has the knowledge that this amazing, beautiful thing is happening in her life. And yet, a day will come when it will bring inconceivable pain. So Mary has just this great strength and this great character. And though Jesus says, my time has not yet come, she turns to the servants and just says, do whatever he tells you. There's no real conversation there between Jesus and Mary. I mean, glance back at verse 5 and, and verse 4 and notice what Jesus didn't say. When Mary says to him, they have no more wine, he did not say, Mom, I'm not getting involved. 
He simply said, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. He asks her a question. Why do you involve me? Jesus is inviting a discussion, a discussion that begs for a response. And so Mary, it seems, interprets Jesus' response to him as leaving the door open, that maybe he will do something about this. And what is so amazing to me is that she just simply doesn't interact with the question. She doesn't attempt to reason with him. She doesn't attempt to get him to to even say anything like, okay, mom, fine, I'll do it. She just ignores the question and moves right along. Turning to the servants, saying, do what he tells you. And how does Jesus respond? Does he respond with any kind of like, whoa, 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 mom. I told you, my time has not yet come. Does he shut this thing down? He could have even said, why are you disrespecting me, mom? I'm not telling those servants anything. I'm out. See ya. Instead, look at verse six. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. They're big. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water out knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheapest wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Did Jesus keep himself and his mission hidden? Did he deny his mom's request because she might be causing him to become too popular too fast? Not at all. Instead, Jesus follows his mom's lead. Tells the servants to fill up these large water jars with water and then take it to the marriage or the master of the banquet who declares this is the best wine. Now think about what happened here. And I I, want to bring you into the story and say, who actually saw this happen? Now, in The Chosen, we saw Jesus ask everybody to leave the room. He goes into the place where these ceremonial water jars are, and he's by himself. The text doesn't tell us that. We don't know. They're they're speculating about that. I wonder who saw this. At this point, we know the servants are involved. We don't know how much. What actually happened? Because saving the best wine for last was super unusual. We heard about that. What that means is that as far as who saw this, the master of the banquet doesn't seem to know who all was involved in this situation or that it was even a miracle at all. Probably actually he didn't care at this point. If he knew there was a problem, like the chosen seems to indicate that there might have been some confusion. Why aren't you bringing out the wine? Bring out the wine. You know, did he even know that it was empty? We're just not totally sure. There's a lot of details that we could speculate. All he cares about at this point is what we did see in the video and what is clearly here in the text. The wedding could continue, meaning there's no problem anymore. But what did happen? I mean, the servants knew something happened. They were the ones that the woman there had told to her son to to do what he said. They were there when the son asked them to fill the jars with water. They knew the issue at hand more than likely was the absence of wine. Someone knew about this. 
And more than likely, it was them because it was their job to make sure that the wine was being spread out around the party. But he tells them to go get water. More than likely, they would have had to go to the town well and bring back bucket after bucket after bucket. If you're filling that many big giant jars, would have taken a while to fill it all up. Why didn't Jesus tell them to get wine? That's kind of the curious thing that's in their minds. If they're thinking that wine is the issue, he should be telling them to go out and find wine. But he says, go get water. The issue was that there wasn't wine. And so they do what he tells them to do. We have to remember who the servants were. They tended to be the people who were lower class on the outskirts of society. They couldn't get better jobs than this. Some might have even been slaves, won by war, or simply bought. It was a part of that culture. We're not exactly sure, but these are, these are lowlier people who tend to do what they're told. And they fetch the water, probably from the well, bucket after bucket. And the bucket brigade finally gets to the point where these things are filled to the brim. And we don't know how it happened. I've often wondered about this. The chosen totally speculates. We have no idea if Jesus actually put his hands in the water to do it. We sometimes, maybe it could be a miracle where as they took the water from the well and carried it back to these jars and they poured it in, that when it hit the bottom of the jar, it turned into wine. Or was it later when the jars were full? We don't know when Jesus actually changed the water into wine. But it very well could be that when Jesus told them to draw some out, then they knew. Because they were the ones that poured water in, and now they were the ones that saw the red wine dripping out. So let's step back a moment and consider this miracle. It's so unique. And yet this isn't the only time that Jesus does a miracle like this. On at least one other occasion, he took a boy's little packed lunch with some fish and some loaves of bread that was enough for that boy to have a good lunch. And Jesus multiplied it so that 10,000 plus people there had enough to eat. But here's the thing. Jesus isn't in the business of providing food and wine for people. His followers were right to take on that concern. In fact, the early church did get into the business of food distribution. Because when people are hungry, they need food. When they are thirsty, they need something to drink. But Jesus didn't do that. He could have gone around Israel if he wanted to, and he could have put all the vineyards out of business, right? No problem. Jesus, if he wanted to, could have put all the farmers and the produce market stands out of business. That's not why he did this. He had another reason for this miracle. And we read about it in verse 11. Look at that. It says, this, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. John tells us clearly this was a miraculous sign. In the Gospel of John, we're going to read about a number of these signs. This is the first one. A sign has a purpose. Think about that key word there, sign. It's a signpost. It points towards something. It tells you where to go or what to look for. Remember that the writer of the Gospel of John, we believe, is actually one of Jesus' 12 disciples, the one named John. He wants us to learn who Jesus is so that we will believe in him. That word believe comes up over and over and over. In this passage, what do we learn about Jesus? We learn that he can change water into wine. We learn that he can do miracles. We learn that he's not only human. He's also God. The miracle is a signpost that says, this is not your regular person. He's also God. There were some people there who were watching that we haven't yet talked about. 
the apprentices. Jesus' disciples were there. And we read that in verse 2 early on. They were invited. Jesus and his disciples go to the wedding. And then for the rest of the story, we just stopped thinking about the disciples. And we talked about the servants and Jesus and Mary and the master of the banquet. But now here in verse 11, we realize, oh my goodness, the disciples were watching the whole time. It wasn't just the servants or the other people that were watching what Jesus did about this miracle. Those men were there too. That's what apprentices do. They follow the master around and they watch what he does. They want to find out an answer to the question, who is this guy? Who is this carpenter, this handyman who has now called fishermen to follow him? And what do they learn? What do they see in this particular episode? They saw that he went to a wedding. Jesus, the gospel writers, tells us, tell us that he went to parties. He celebrated. Not just this one time, but there will be many other parties in Jesus' life. The next party, it seems, was actually not that long after this one. We, learn, we don't learn about it in the Gospel of John, so let me just briefly tell it to you. Uh, if you want, you can read about it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Luke chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 27, we read this. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus did not act like the prevailing view said he should act the prevailing view of a religious teacher and leader. Those religious elite, they would not be caught dead at that particular party with tax collectors and sinners. They wouldn't be caught dead doing much of what Jesus would do. And so the disciples are watching Jesus. He went to a party. He went to a wedding. He celebrated. Particularly, he was the kind of guy that partied with sinners and regular people alike. Now notice very clearly in that account in Luke, Jesus was not just affirming sin. He called them to repentance. And so his partying with them was not an affirmation of their sinful choices, but an affirmation of their worth in God's eyes. They were loved by God, even though they were tax collectors and sinners. And therefore, God wanted to be in a real relationship with them. And that real relationship includes the call to repent. Asking them to stop their lifestyle of sin. Because those ways are opposed to God's heart. And repentance calls them to start choosing ways that are in line with God's heart. And the disciples saw this too. They also saw not only was he a, a, a leader who would go to parties, unlike the other religious leaders, they saw him interact with his mom. They saw he had a close relationship with his mother. Uh, probably, I think they also saw that Mary was bold. She seemed really fun, humorous, vibrant. I don't know if Jesus and Mary's relationship was typical or atypical for a mother-son relationship in that particular culture. But the disciples couldn't help avoid noticing that this mom told her son, their leader, to do something. And their leader did what his mom said, even after a little bit of a protest. This shows Jesus' humility, his humanity, his great relationship with his mother, his willingness to interact with her, to show her respect. 
And finally, the disciples saw a miracle worker. And it was amazing. The miracle was a sign that pointed to the reality that Jesus wasn't just human. He was also God. In verse 11, we read that he revealed his glory to them. Now, that's a phrase that indicates his divinity. Jesus was 100% human and 100% God at the same time. God did not create Jesus. Jesus is God. When you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Read about Jesus. Study Jesus. And he shows you what God is like. When he turned that water into, into wine, it was as though Jesus was opening this door to a reality that the disciples had never seen before. And when they looked, they saw his glory. Glory. What does that mean that they saw his glory? Only God has that glory. Don't think of some sort of a blinding light from heaven. Don't think of a halo around his head. Don't think of the northern lights. Glory can refer to many things. But when it comes to God, glory is the ability to demonstrate power that is supernatural. Glory is a magnificence that is superhuman. They saw Jesus' glory manifested in this mysterious power that turned water into wine. Without saying a word, without waving a magic wand, no potion, no incantation. And when they saw his glory, they placed their faith in him, we read. This was a new faith. This is not the faith of people who have walked with Jesus for 80 years. They just met the guy probably a month and a half or so before this. And so theirs was an immature faith, but it still was enough faith to say, I will be your apprentice, Jesus. I will follow you. I don't think theirs was a faith that was saying something like, Oh, I'm going to follow you uh, to the end until whenever I die. But I think theirs was a faith that motivated them to be close to him. To keep taking those steps, following him as he took steps in front of them. They saw his glory and they wanted to be near him. They wanted to learn from him how to live. I don't know about you, but when I read that verse 11, I think to myself, man, I wish I could see his glory. But I would suggest that you almost certainly have already many times. Now, you and I have the benefit of hindsight, something that the disciples did not have at that moment. They did not know what was going to happen as they started following him. They had no idea that three years from that time, approximately, their worlds would be turned upside down through his crucifixion and his resurrection. You and I know that, though. We have the benefit of 2,000 years of hindsight. We have the benefit of knowing what it means that Jesus gave his life on the cross and died and rose again. That's glory. We get to see the glory of the Father, of the Son, and of the Spirit manifested in that amazing miracle. Talk about a magnificence, a demonstration of power that is beyond human ability. The resurrection is the epitome of it all. But I think we've also seen him work in our lives. We can look back even in the history of our church family these 50 plus years and see the glory of God as he has provided miraculously sometimes. We have seen him, if we look in our own personal lives, the glory of God, keeping his promises, providing for us, sometimes through healing, sometimes through provision. We have seen the glory of God in our lives, sometimes even in miracles, some of you have encountered. We have seen his glory, this incredible power. It's the glory of the one and only. And the right response as his disciples, when we see his glory in our lives, is to do what they did. And that is to place our faith in him and follow him. 
no matter how big or small that faith is. So think about the times as you look back in your life when it was desperate, when you had no idea how you were going to get through this or how things could possibly turn out and God showed you his glory. Use those memories of the manifestation of the glory of God to fill your heart and mind so that you place your faith in him and say, Lord, I am going to follow you. As we study the the gospel of John uh, week in, week out, it's going to be for a while because this is a long book. You're going to notice that word glory pops up many different times. It's one of the other main themes of the gospel of John. Believe and glory are two of the big ones. And so we'll want to pay attention to how Jesus continues to reveal his glory to his disciples. Let me give you a hint. Glory in the gospel of John is not found in a worship service. Glory in the gospel of John is not found in music. Why? Because those are human. They can be wonderful. No doubt about it. I think they can be very helpful for us, reminding us that God manifests his glory in the world. But God's glory is not something that humans can replicate. We can point to it. We can, dis- we can declare it. And so when we gather on Sundays to sing songs and worship the Lord, this is a very helpful practice that every Sunday we are reminding ourselves, where is the glory of Lord? It's not in this room because of music and preaching and teaching. We do that. And that's a good thing. But we look for the glory of God manifested in his amazing power all around us. And so we need this practice of worship to help us to have that awe and wonder and think about the manifestation of the glory of God. We can see God's glory in nature. We can see God's glory in his provision in our lives, in his healing, in the work of his Holy Spirit. And so this week, Would you ask God to show you his glory? Ask him to help you to be more aware of his work, his supernatural, magnificent work in the world. Look for God's glory, not in a worship service. Maybe in the outskirts. In the side room where the water jugs are filled with water by servants who almost never get a mention in the story. Don't look at the high and mighty, not in the celebrities who already get all the attention. Watch for the hidden details. Ask God to give you the eyes of the servants, the eyes of the disciples, these fishermen turned apprentices who get to see his glory. And then walk with him. Follow him. Place your faith in him, saying, Lord, I don't know where this is all headed, but I have seen your glory and I give my life to take step by step in following you. Teach me how to live. That's what the disciples got. That was the most important part of this miracle. Lord, teach us how to see your glory and how to follow you. Thank you that you are alive and well and at work in glorious ways in the world still today. Lord, I pray that you would do a a new work in our lives that we may perhaps in a new way follow you step by step. Putting aside all those things that distract us. Help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.